Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen? Go ahead, click that subscribe button. Really does help our channel grow, our audience grow, and I really do appreciate it more than you know. So click that subscribe button. Appreciate your support. Now, here's the video that you came here for. All right, everybody. I'm back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Uh, so want to go ahead it is monday evening want to go ahead and update you on a very interesting development in the college hoops transfer portal for monday now look normally we would do the full-fledged recap of the portal monday was crazy about five six seven marquee players entered we got a couple marquee commitments as well by the way as you can see on the ticker if you're not following on twitter at cbb transfers on twitter also, we have just started an Instagram page with all of the late breaking news, commitments, visits, and more. Make sure you're following CBB Transfers on both Twitter and our new Instagram account. Same time, though, I do want to talk transfers, but what I want to do is something different today. Rather than just focusing on, um, you know, rather than just focusing on the seven, eight, 10 players that entered on Monday, a couple big commitments over the course of the day, we'll do that on the Tuesday night show, uh, you know, full show, whatever. Instead today, though, what I want to go ahead and do is focus on one player specifically who to me is maybe the most intriguing prospect in all of the portal, a guy that just entered on Monday afternoon, but also a player that bluntly, as I found out on these Twitter streets, is very polarizing as DJ Wagner, former number one high school player in the class of 2023, was the number one player for most of that recruiting cycle. Ended up being a top five player, McDonald's All-American, McDonald's All-American game MVP. Well, after one season at Kentucky, with John Calipari leaving, he has entered the transfer portal as first reported by Travis Branham of 24-7 Sports. And to me, he is one of the most intriguing players available. And he's also intriguing because it feels like he is going to have a wide open recruitment, according to Travis Branham. He is a kid that will consider returning to Kentucky. He will speak with Mark Pope before making any final decisions. He is truly open in the portal process. So it doesn't sound like it's a done deal that he just follows John Calipari to Kentucky. And he will also enter the NBA draft or at least look into it. And so for all those reasons, I believe he is the most intriguing prospect in this portal right now. Now, as I said, According to some people that I heard on Twitter, I didn't know he was a polarizing kid, but apparently he was because when I tweeted about him, some people love him, some people don't. I think he's frankly a little bit misunderstood. All right, so DJ Wagner, first year at Kentucky. By the way, it was really funny. Um, I saw uh, Joe Tipton, the great uh, recruiting uh, uh, newsbreaker at the Final Four. We were talking for a little bit. I was joking with him. Oh, it must be nice to that there was a little bit of a dead period in recruiting. This kid's been all over everything, but why I bring it up is I said to Joe, I said, I feel like there's still some big moves to be made over the course of the next few weeks. And he kind of smirked and, and Joe, no, Joe is certainly on the inside more than I am. But I was thinking about Hunter Dickinson did not enter the portal until final four weekend last year. So you knew big moves were coming. DJ Wagner is the latest. And again, I think he's a fascinating prospect, a former top five player, number one player in his class for most of the 2023 cycle. Now, what's interesting about DJ Wagner is that the how you feel about him is kind of based on the perception of who he is, who he could be, whatever. He's clearly not a perfect prospect because if he was, he'd be in the NBA draft right now, projected to be a top five, top 10 pick. Okay. So he's not perfect, but he's six foot four, averaged almost 10 points per game at Kentucky this year, about three and a half assists per game. Did not shoot the ball well, which is something that a lot of people commented on when I tweeted about him on on uh, on on Monday morning. Only shot twenty nine percent from the field this or twenty nine percent from three this season. So he's not a perfect prospect, but six foot four, good frame, good pedigree. Obviously, he's the son of Dewan Wagner. Um, but also because of the way he shot, a lot of people are turned off about the possibility of bringing him in. Now, in my opinion, let me say this about DJ Wagner. I believe he is both misunderstood, and I also think he was kind of the secret sauce to the best versions of Kentucky this year. Why do I think that he was misunderstood? Well, it is because, 
listen, it, it was a weird year at Kentucky, right? A lot of highs, a lot of lows. But obviously, over the course of the season, Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham emerged as the two best freshman guards on that roster. Antonio Reeves, obviously, was probably the best player overall on that roster as well. And so over the course of the season, anytime anything went wrong, why is Reed not starting? Why is Rob not starting? Why is DJ starting? I actually feel the exact opposite. If you watch the games closely, what I truly believe in my heart of hearts is that the best version of Kentucky was when DJ Wagner was on the floor or at least in the starting lineup, okay? Now, you can disagree. You can fight with me, but let me explain. Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham right now are certainly the better NBA draft prospects. As I'm recording, Reed Shepard has not declared. Rob Dillingham has. Both will be top 10 picks if they end up going to the draft. Again, we're waiting on Reed Shepard. But I bring it up to say this, is that if you actually watch the team, you know what stood out to me? When DJ Wagner was in the lineup, that was the best version of Kentucky, and it was for this simple reason. It is because it allowed you to get the best version of Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham as well. Reed Shepard is a great basketball player. But Reed Shepard was most effective when he's playing starters minutes both on and off the ball. When DJ Wagner got hurt in the middle of the year, remember the Tennessee game they lost at home at Rupp Arena, Reed Shepard had to be the point guard. And it limited what made Reed Shepard great. Reed Shepard in a perfect world. You want to be able to play him off the ball, but on the ball as well. Now, certainly there are going to be moments where Reed Shepard has the ball in his hands and he's making plays for others. But it also helps you when you have another point guard on the floor with him that allows some of the ball handling pressure to come off Reed Shepard, which then allows Reed Shepard to be the best version of himself. I feel the same way about Rob Dillingham. Rob Dillingham was the revelation of the season in college basketball, okay? Most people didn't know what to expect from him. He plays himself into what feels like top five status in this upcoming NBA draft. But if you watch Kentucky close enough, Rob Dillingham was probably a player that was best coming off the bench, best playing about 25 to 30, 31 minutes a game because he provided that spark. He provided that energy. And when he would come in the game off the bench, good things happen. Kentucky would go on a 6-0, 8-0, 10-0 run when he's in the game. Kentucky would go on, again, a 10-2 run, whatever. When Rob Dillingham was asked to do too much, you'd get that good stuff, but you'd also get the, 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 the moments where he takes two or three bad shots in a row, and the 10-2 run you just went on is negated because the other team went on a 7-0 run right back. And so the best version of Rob Dillingham was probably 25 to 31, 32 minutes, not 38, 39 minutes like when DJ Wagner was hurt. So to bring it back to DJ Wagner, enough talking about everybody else. Kentucky's best version was with him on the court. And I truly believe he is that chess piece that you can play on the ball, that you can play off the ball. And yes, the numbers need to be better, but I am betting on a pedigree where for four or five years, he was one of the best players in this class. And I don't think he forgot to play basketball overnight. Now the question becomes, what are the best spots for, uh, for DJ Wagner if he ultimately decides to transfer. I think there's a lot of intriguing options. I think the first option, in my opinion, I don't think there's any doubt. I think the intriguing option is going and staying at Kentucky. That is right. We got hope in Mark Pope. You see the t-shirt at the bottom of the screen there, details on that. But I bring it up because at the end of the day, with DJ Wagner, listen, I think staying at Kentucky is a great option. Now, he has no relationship with Mark Pope. It's on Mark Pope to build that relationship. But first off, I give DJ Wagner credit for being willing to be open to the idea of staying at Kentucky. And this isn't staying at Kentucky to play for some random dude. This is staying at Kentucky to play in one of the most dynamic offenses in all of college basketball. Now, I think it depends on who ends up staying at Kentucky or what the pieces are around him. If Reed Shepard comes back, I think it makes it more appealing for uh, for 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 uh, for DJ Wagner. If uh, if Mark Pope somehow convinces Boogie Fland, who asked out of his letter of intent to to come to Kentucky, I think it makes it more appealing for DJ Wagner. So part of it is who is he going to play with? But listen, that system that Mark Pope runs, where they averaged 81 points per game, where they had a million open shots, a million layups. Listen, if you're a guard who at times struggled this year offensively to get confidence and to get your shot. What more do you want 
than to play in the system where guards have freedom to make plays. Guards have freedom to do what they want. Guards have freedom uh, to miss a shot without immediately getting pulled. And that's not a dig on John Calipari. It's just a reality. Mark Pope is new age. The offense is new age. He is going to put guards in the NBA in that offense. Just because he really hasn't yet, because the recruiting pool is so much smaller, doesn't mean he can't. And so because of it, I think Kentucky is a legitimately great option for DJ Wagner. Now, what'll be interesting, what about going to play for John Calipari at Arkansas? Listen, I think it's a great option. I think it's a great option for Kentucky or for for, for uh, DJ Wagner. I think it's obviously a, a building block for John Calipari if he can pull it off. And listen, we can criticize Cal, but at the end of the day, he had a lot of mouths to feed. I think the good thing for Cal at Arkansas is he can kind of rebuild this roster as he sees fit. Everybody knows that the best version of John Calipari's teams really only plays about seven to eight players. Well, this last offseason, because of injuries, because you didn't know if you were going to get Aaron Bradshaw back, you didn't know if you were going to get Agana and Yenso back, you had to over-recruit. I think it created a logjam. And I think if I'm DJ Wagner, I say, okay, if I'm coming, what is the backcourt looking like? How many dudes are you taking? Because if I can have the ball in my hands, I still believe I can be successful if we're running an offense similar to the one that we just ran last year at Kentucky. There's obviously a comfort level. Obviously, the family loves John Calipari, and I'm fascinated to see if DJ follows follows Cal to Arkansas. Now, on the counter, I think it's also worth noting, like, Cal, and I'm not a Cal critic, I think Cal was really good this year, all things considered. Bad ending, good season, finished second in the SEC at Kentucky. But at the same time, I do think the family has to make some tough decisions on this. We know about the family relationship. We know about the family dynamic. But that shouldn't be the be-all, end-all for DJ Wagner. He was supposed to be a one-and-done. He's not a one-and-done. And so now you have to make a business decision. It's not about personal relationships. It's not about friendships. It's not about doing Coach Cal a favor. It's about is Coach Cal, is, is Arkansas the best place for you to succeed and for you to thrive? And if it is, then you go. I think it'll be interesting, again, like Kentucky, what is the sales pitch from John Calipari that convinces you that you should or should not come to Arkansas. Now, in terms of other schools, I'll say this. I put out a school, and I was like sort of surprised by the backlash to it. Um, but what I will say is a school that I immediately thought of that a lot of people would disagree with, and apparently a lot of people in the fan base do disagree with, I think if you're not going back to Kentucky, if you're not following John Calipari to Arkansas, the school that immediately came to mind to me was UConn. I'm not trying to be a UConn homer. I'm not trying to, you know, stack my roster because trust me, high school and college recruits are not listening to Aaron Torres on college choices, okay? But when you look at UConn, a couple things stand out. DJ Wagner's from the Northeast. He's from Camden, New Jersey. Get a little bit closer to home. And the one thing about UConn, this UConn system produces NBA guards. James Booknight was a lottery pick. Uh, Jordan Hawkins was a lottery pick. Cam Spencer, two years ago, was playing at Loyola of Maryland. He is probably going to get drafted in the second round this year. If not, he will definitely be on a summer league roster. Tristan Newton will definitely be on a summer league roster. And I think if you're DJ Wagner and you cannot miss on this pick, you know you can go to UConn. You're going to get developed. You're going to get coached hard. And they're putting dudes in the league. To me, it's kind of a no-brainer. Now, UConn fail. oh, he can't shoot. He can't do this. He can't do that. Well, guess what? Tristan Newton was a 33% three-point shooter when he got to uh, UConn after uh, three years at Eastern Carolina, at East Carolina, excuse me. A couple years later, 36%, 37% three-point shooter. So it's not as though you can't be developed in the system. And right now, nobody is better at developing guards than UConn is. I think it's worth a phone call from UConn. Remember, too, by the way, UConn's going to lose Tristan Newton. UConn's going to lose Cam Spencer. We'll run our Hassan DR interview later this week. I don't want to spoil it. I think Hassan is genuinely torn on, on his future as a college basketball player. And so you may have major vacancies at the guard position. Hassan, of course, has a COVID year of eligibility. I don't know if he's coming back or not. And so you need guards. 
you have a high four star, low five star in Ahmad Noel committed, but he's probably not ready to be a 30 minute a game guy next year. Bring in DJ Wagner and pass the torch. Say, dude, come in. Look what we did for Tristan Newman. Look what we did for Cam Spencer. Look what we did for Jordan Hawkins. Come play here for a year. Start where Ahmad Noel backs you up, and then Ahmad Noel can take the torch from you. Just a thought, but I think it's worth considering. Obviously, the other big name school in the tri state area um, has produced certainly um, their coach anyway, a ton of NBA players. Had some St. John's fans ask me about DJ Wagner. I think it's worth a phone call from St. John's. First of all, St. John's, they have plenty of NIL money. Uh, Rapoli, the, the vitamin water guy who's a big booster at St. John's, said, I'm writing Rick Patino a blank check. So you get paid. You get to go back to the New York Tri-State area. You get to be the face of a rebuild at St. John's University in Madison Square Garden on the biggest stage in basketball, which is Madison Square Garden. Not a bigger stage than Kentucky. Kentucky fans don't get mad. But you get the point. So I'll be very interested to see. And listen, by the way, there's going to be other schools. If DJ Wagner really is open to uh, other possibilities, then let's call a spade a spade. I'm sure Alabama's going to call. I'm sure Gonzaga's going to call. I'm sure everybody's going to call. Hope DJ does what's best for him. Think it will be fascinating. But as you can tell, I am a DJ Wagner fan, and I think it is underappreciated and underrated how good he was this year.